Okay. Please welcome our next speaker, uh, Professor Robert Robert Belton from Pennsylvania State University, USA, with his highlight lecture on uh, relative motion of satellites. Professor Belton, please welcome. Thank you, Valerian. Uh, the, the title of uh, thank you. the title of this lecture probably should be called "Highlights of Relative Motion," um, and in fact, it focuses only on unperturbed relative motion. So there's too much to cover in 25 minutes. So there's a long history of, of the use of relative motion analysis, uh, particularly in satellite docking. And, uh, the most prominent of these, the Apollo Soyuz mission in 1975. Um, the uh, Soyuz at Mir, uh, Space Shuttle Hubble Repair Mission, Progress Docking ISS, and so forth. So I'm going to start all the way back at the beginning, linearized equations, because this is the easiest case, in fact, the only case that you can solve really analytically and exactly. So if we assume, let's see, I have a pointer. So we talk about a satellite that's referred to either as the chief or the target satellite. Um, and it is at a fixed radius r star, so in a circular orbit. And then the second satellite is either called the deputy or the chase satellite. And it has a radius measured as delta r uh, vector position relative to the chief or target spacecraft. And so the equation of motion then is written in terms of this different differential position, delta r. And gamma is any perturbation, and gamma is going to show up in the equations, but we're going to ignore it because we don't have any way to handle it very easily. Uh, so when it linearizes the gravitational effect, you, you do it to first order with respect to the chief or the, the target spacecraft. And you ignore terms of uh, order delta r squared and higher. So this is written in terms of this gravity gradient. Uh, it's a tensor, um, second order. And it has this form in matrix form and so forth. Now, for all this to work uh, really well, you do this in what's called a Hill frame. And we'll come back to this in a minute because the name of the equations associated with relative motion in a linearized system uh, includes Hill's name sometimes, not always. Um, so uh, Hill, an astronomer in 1878, in, in analyzing uh, motion uh, with respect to uh, the moon, uh, proposed writing equations uh, using a frame of reference, which is um, rotating with the target spacecraft. And the, uh, and the assumption is, again, that the target spacecraft is in a circular orbit. And so this is referred to as the Hill frame. Now, in 1960, Clohessy and Wilshire published a paper that also used this frame. And Hill somehow got forgotten in all of this. And so, so sometimes these equations that Clohessy and Wilshire developed are called the CW equations. More recently, we're calling them the HCW, or hill clohessy wilshire equations. And all of this was done in rectilinear coordinates. And we'll come back to this in a minute, because it turns out that this is not, that this is not a great choice of coordinate systems for accuracy. It's very nice for analysis, and, and it's, it's great for uh, control applications, but maybe not so great for accuracy. So to remind you, R star is constant. And the linearized equations look like this, and again, we're going to ignore the, the gammas here. All right. So in recent times, um, De Bruyne, Gill, and Howe uh, derived the HCW equations in fully spherical coordinates. Let me back up for a minute and say that it was known, certainly before this, that instead of uh, using rectilinear coordinates, that you could replace the, uh, the y coordinate here. You could replace y with the radius of the target vehicle times an angular coordinate. But then generally, people left the z component as a rectilinear outer plane. So they were solving these in, in cylindrical 
that's okay, but it's much better to do it this way. So in spherical coordinates, uh, with r, theta, and phi measured this way, we get the HCW equations now in spherical coordinates. By the way, this had been proposed uh, earlier by uh, some authors, including Raoul Vidali, Terry Alfrand, Edward uh, Gill, Amy Garfield. So the linear solution, linearized solution, looks like this. The important thing to note is that in the second row, which involves the position and velocity in the y direction, and again, this is in either rectilinear coordinates or in cylindrical coordinates, that there is this secular term here and the secular term here. So this, of course, is caused by the difference in orbital periods between the chief spacecraft, which is in the circular orbit, and the deputy spacecraft, which is in a slightly elliptical orbit. And there's a condition for the validity of all this, which is that the distance between the chief and the deputy must be small relative to the radius of the uh, orbit of the chief spacecraft. So this just has to do with physical scales, and it makes good sense for the validity of the gravitational uh, representation uh, for that to be linearized. There's also nonlinear terms appearing in the kinematics, and so there are two effects that sort of work uh, against you here. So here's a com comparison of what happens, and this was shown in this paper by Debris and uh, Gil and Howe, that if you look at the position error in Cartesian coordinates over time, short amount of time, 120 seconds or 6,000 seconds, and then compare that to what happens if you do the same exact simulation in, Cartesian, uh, in the spherical coordinates, that you get about two to three orders of magnitude improved accuracy in uh, all three of the representations, but it's particularly improved in that along track or what is so-called Y coordinate uh, compared to the rectilinear. In the early 2000s, uh, Chris Carlgaard and Professor Fred Lutz examined this problem, now expanding everything to include all quadratic terms. And they did this, it's an interesting method, it's to use the method of uh, multiple uh, scales. And so when you expand in spherical coordinates using method of multiple scales to second order, you get these uh, somewhat more involved equations. And these are now fully coupled uh, across all the three coordinates. Um, this is done in dimensionless time. The derivatives here are with respect to the dimensionless time, uh, which is scaled according to n, n is the mean motion velocity of the chief spacecraft. So again, this all refers to the circular orbit for the chief spacecraft. There's a, a parameter here, epsilon, which is a formal parameter. If you, if you are familiar with the method of multiple scales, uh, you insert this parameter in order to do the expansion, and then you remove it by setting it equal to one. Of course, it's very important that if you go through all of this formalism and you set epsilon to zero, you had better get the HCW equations. In fact, that's what happens. So it's, it's a check on the validity of the expansion. So here's, here's a piece of the solution. So there, there are six parts to it, of course, because it's a six-dimensional uh, state variable. So the delta radial component, the full solution looks like this. And there are, of course, five similar equations. So it's, it's rather messy looking. But remember, this is an, uh, it's an analytic approximation. So it's something that could be used quite successfully for onboard purposes because there's no numerical integration involved at all. And the uh, accuracy is, is, again, quite good. So uh, if you compare uh, what they call first order exact, it's really numerical integration of the first order equations, uh, the first order, or second order analytical, and the second order numerical solutions, um, again, there's about a two order magnitude uh, increase in accuracy using their second order of representation. Oops. All right. So I want to talk about elliptical reference orbits because now things become more interesting. If the chief spacecraft is in the elliptical orbit and the deputy spacecraft is in the elliptical orbit, now you have, uh, of course, again, different orbital periods. Um, but you can no longer represent 
the motion relative to something that has a constant uh, radial distance, uh, its orbital distance. So the first to, to examine this were Schoner and Hempel, 1965. They presented equations where the G for the target spacecraft is in the elliptical orbit. Now, derivatives are with respect to uh, true anomaly, F. So these are called the Schoner-Hempel equations. Again, they include the possibility of putting in perturbing uh, uh, effects. By the way, I'm saying we're ignoring the perturbing effects. You could, in principle, go back and include these once you obtain the solution and you have the state transition matrix, the linear state transition matrix. You can always convolve that with the perturbing effects in order to include that as, as part of the solution. It's easier said than done, formally accomplished. All right, so one of the disadvantages of these equations is that they're written in terms of true anomaly being the independent variable, not time. So for analytical purposes, or for writing out sort of preliminary designs for control laws and so forth, this is okay. But if you were going to implement them uh, in some sort of onboard system, of course the control designers and mission controllers and so forth would prefer to be working with uh, equations and solutions all that were explicit in time. So to look at now how well this was considered, I apologize for the change in the form of slides. I had some technical problems with the software in, in creating the lecture. So. All right. So again, this is not meant to be all inclusive, uh, an all inclusive survey in any means, but I'm going to point out a few, few key solutions that were proposed for this. So, Yamanaka and Ankerson developed this solution where they have a state transition matrix, the relative motion of an arbitrary elliptical orbit. Uh, Professor Tom Carter used this to uh, look for uh, some optimal control solutions, and, and this worked, worked quite well. Um, it, sorry, he first did it by other means in 1998, but later he, he uh, used their solution. So here's the form of their equations. And now uh, they're using theta for true anomaly. And so you get this sort of nice compact representation. The solution has this form. It's a little strange. The, the uh, uh, in-plane component uh, relative to the plane of the chief spacecraft has a state transition matrix that depends on true anomaly and time. So time appears explicitly. There's still true anomaly. The out-of-plane component is strictly dependent on uh, true anomaly. Uh, Roger Brook considered this problem using uh, a method very similar to something that uh, De Vries had, had proposed. Um, and his formulation, I should say their formulations, are, are really very similar. And again, you've got the state transition matrix in the solution that is a function of true anomaly and time, and the out-of-plane component just a function of true anomaly. So again, for analytic purposes, this works quite well. And it's, it's better than starting from scratch with the schoner hempel equations. But for implementation, you still have this problem of dependence on true anomaly. And of course, to solve for position explicitly as a function of time where true anomaly is involved. This would involve solving a Kepler problem, converting true anomaly to eccentric, and then solving the Kepler problem uh, for, for given times and so forth. So <clears throat> I looked at this problem in terms of how it could be written explicitly in terms of only time, um, and developed a, a solution uh, at the time uh, using um, symbolic manipulation. We, capability then was only up through about second order. Um, uh, Vidali, uh, Alfred, and, and uh, their student, uh, Vadi, uh, considered this and, and expanded it out to uh, order uh, three uh, in eccentricity of the chief orbit. And by the way, in, in these expansions, you sometimes get these false secular terms that are non-physical. So they, they omitted the false secular terms in, to make this uh, valid solution. So it, the, the form of the solution looks like this without going into great detail. So you have a state transition matrix that's expanded um, in terms of eccentricity. There's phi zero, which is the uh, HCW state transition matrix. And it can be done either in rectangular coordinates or in 
uh, any curvilinear system that you wish, but it has a very different form for, for each one. And then terms of order eccentricity, eccentricity squared, uh, and so forth. Now, to compare these, it turns out that even though the mathematical form of Yamanaka and Ankerson and Brook and Debris looks different, they yield exactly the same results. So if you plot uh, for given initial conditions and eccentricity, what the error is in the in-plane uh, angular position, uh, you see it, it stays quite low until the eccentricity reaches something on the order of about 0.5, and then it begins to grow rather quickly. Uh, and this is, I'm sorry, it's cut off here. This is the velocity. Error. So here, you know, the problem is not so much in eccentricity, but in the initial um, velocity in the in-plane component that now produces a pretty substantial error. Nevertheless, it's, it's considerably more accurate than trying to apply HCW to the problem where both satellites are in elliptical orbits. That, that uh, degrades very quickly. Sorry, this is uh, simply showing the, the same thing, but now with uh, initial conditions, uh, different set of <coughs> The solution uh, method that I have that's explicit in time works fairly well to eccentricities of about 0.3, uh, and then it begins to grow fairly quickly. And again, there's a strong dependence on the velocity component in plane uh, in terms of velocity air, not so much on eccentricity. Now, there's an entirely different way of approaching this, and that is to write these equations and the solutions in terms of orbital elements. So Garrison, Gardner, and Axelrad, uh, back over 20 years ago, and then much more recently, H.P. Uh, Shaw, uh, considered looking at this in terms of uh, OEDs, which is not Oxford English Dictionary, it's the orbital element differences. So the differences in the orbital elements between these this actually leads to uh, similar levels of accuracy that you can obtain with either Yamanaka and Ankerson and Brook or with the methods that, that I did with uh, expanding the set transition matrix. Um, but it's particularly helpful when you're applying this to cases where there are perturbations that must be considered. So for example, in, in relatively low Earth, medium Earth orbits, you want to include J2 effects. This kind of approach will work far, far better. It's, it's far more natural and far more efficient than any of the previous methods. The other way to do this is through something called, and this is a little confusing, and not the same as OEDs, but relative orbital elements. This refers to the fact that when one can create these uh, relative uh, position and velocity components, no matter how you write the equations, that there are certain integrals of the motion that appear. And so, uh, Bennett and Schaub and others refer to these as uh, elements pertaining to the relative orbits, relative orbit representation. And again, those also give very good, uh, accurate representations for orbits that are both elliptical. Um, and in this particular paper, that's fairly new, they were able to write this in terms of non-singular uh, relative orbit elements, avoid so some complications there. It's most useful when there's perturbed motion involved. So some other considerations are uh, J2 effects. All friend at all have been published extensively on how to include these. Uh, that's uh, quite interesting to see how, how that's been handled. They've been able to develop, again, an expanded state transition matrix where uh, J2 effects are included. Non-conservative effects, uh, the perturbations, drag, low thrust, and so forth. And just, uh, I highly recommend this paper. It's fairly recent by uh, Sullivan, Greenberg, and uh, Danico, uh, University of Stanford, and Stanford University. Uh, comprehensive survey and assessment uh, of relative motion. It's not exactly all-inclusive, but it's almost 100% inclusive. So there's a video that I wanted to show in, in the, the slide that was embedded and it didn't run. But I'd like to show you this because it's, it's what got me interested in working on this problem. And it's still an ongoing uh, problem of interest uh, in the future. So this is the 
uh, simulation of the orbit for the proposed mission called LISA. LISA is the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna that is now proposed to launch in 2034. So you may actually be working on, on this mission. The, the idea is that you have uh, uh, an interferometer which requires three spacecraft, these three dots, which are uh, entering, uh, they're in heliocentric orbit. The three orbits all have equal eccentricity and very small inclination. It's, it's just a fraction of the degree of inclination. Um, but the right ascension of sending node for each of these is equally spaced around the sun. And so the result is that uh, one of these spacecraft, for example, reaches the highest uh, point above the ecliptic at the same time that another one is, or the other two are uh, equally spaced below it and so forth. Uh, and so they each cross the uh, ecliptic uh, at one third of the way around uh, each of the orbits. And as a result of this, you get this configuration that is a triangle and it's orbiting about 50 million kilometers behind the Earth. Why, why are they doing this? Well, the, the red lines are lasers uh, to measure um, the effect of a passing gravity wave coming through that would cause a ch differential change in the distance between different pairs of these satellites. And the difference in the distance is something on the order of about 10 to the minus 16 times the length between any two satellites. And so therefore, the greater the length between the satellites, the more easier it is to measure the, the strain, the spatial strain that occurs. So, <clears throat> what does this have to do with relative motion? Because this looks pretty simple. Well, this is a simplified uh, simulation of this. The, the distance between the satellites is not constant because they're on elliptical orbits uh, and they are each passing through uh, periapsis and helium at different times. What actually happens is that the arms of the triangle will uh, successively expand and contract. But this happens in a very predictable way, so all of that can be accounted for in the control system for this. Uh, but it also has the, the advantage of uh, providing different uh, angular uh, positioning, orientation of the plane of the constellation with respect to the cosmos, and so it becomes sensitive to gravity waves coming from potentially different directions. So, the notion of needing to apply um, accurate models and, and providing accurate uh, approximate solutions for satellites in elliptical orbits uh, is driven by missions such as this, uh, and, and this is what we find so fascinating. So, thank you. Have you got any questions for Professor Melton? Um, so there's been a lot of work on the elliptic problem. I've been looking recently at the hyperbolic Shatter Hempel. Hempel, yeah. do you know of any literature on that? Yeah, yeah I noticed you mentioned that um, yesterday. Yeah, that works. So, so, yeah, works well. yeah, so I'm, I'm interested in, in pursuing a little more with you. I'm not aware of any other publications uh, in that, I mean, other than some numerical <coughs> studies. That I'm not sure that's any use to. Okay. In this uh, uh, last triangle configuration, do uh, they require a closer active control? Yes, so yeah, the question is in, in, in this LISA configuration, they need continuous attitude control. They do. So what actually happens is that there is uh, a spacecraft that is, each of the spacecraft is actually a protective cage, in effect, around a reflecting object, which is a, a gold cube, and that serves as the reflecting mirror for the laser. So <clears throat> you need to have a spacecraft around the cube because you've got to protect the, the cube from um, other external disturbances as well, including gravitational disturbances. And then, of course, you've got to be able to orient the spacecraft for communication purposes, uh, for slight attitude corrections, slight orbital corrections and so 
introduce our next speaker. It's Professor Howell from Purdue University, USA, with her highlight lecture titled uh, Incorporating Low Thrust for Trajectory Design in a Multi-Body Regime. Professor Kathleen Howell. 